So, really, we're talking about just a, a bunch of different um, questions that aren't really related um, throughout the next two weeks, this week and next week. Um, oops, sorry. Um, if you guys remember last year, we talked about um, we talked about apologetic things. The, the top questions Christians have known will ask. We talked about cult, the cults, um, and we talked about witnessing. And throughout all of it, there was kind of that that. Um, theme of, of questions. Um, and if you remember when we got going on that, there was a story that was told by, um, I believe it was Mark Middleberg, about um, the teenagers um, who, who uh, were asking questions and nobody can answer the questions, and they just got frustrated with the whole thing. And so they formed their little disbelief group. You guys remember this from last, from last year? Um, and so then they, they, they formed their little, their little group and had like a disbelief group until Mark came and answered their questions. And then they turned it back into a, a, a Bible study group. So, I mean, it, those little nagging questions turned into a big issue for them because it was just something that was left unanswered, unresolved. You, you know what I mean? And do you guys remember that at all? Not really? Um so then that brings us to the questions. Have you guys ever had questions that were never answered for you, spiritually speaking? A, 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 a Bible question, maybe, or a Christianity question that was never answered. Um, I can think of one that someone's always asked me, and I'm like... Would you like to share? Oh, uh, sure. Um, they they would always ask the question, and it really bothered, bothered them that um, why why were the uh, uh, Jews God's chosen people? Why aren't we God's chosen people? I I just don't think they had a full understanding of the Bible. Ah. Yeah. You know? Ah. So they they didn't read Matthew then, huh? Oh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I kid. I kid. Yeah. Um, another question that someone's asked me that I didn't um, realize the question until after I was done talking to them was, um, and it always bothered them to the point to where they stop, almost stopped being a Christian, was why is there so many translations of the Bible? Shouldn't there only be one correct one? Mm. And I didn't realize until afterwards that, well, the translations is of the original Bible. Mm -hmm. what See, th th that doesn't seem very important to some of us, does it? But to that person, they almost gave up their Christian walk for it. Yeah. Those little nagging questions. Anybody else have another example? <laughs> did, how did how, since uh, since you're the one who answered the question, Grace? How did it affect you? Um. Well, it got me thinking at first, but then. Later, when I thought through the question and I actually sat down and realized the answer, um, it made me feel kind of sad that they didn't get to the same conclusion as I did. Oh. So, did you did, did you ever try talking to to these people about these questions? Um, I didn't get a chance to. After oh, okay. Once. It was like a one-time thing. Hmm. I got gotcha. you. Just asking. Did anybody have anything to add? So that takes us to. There, it happened to me one time when I was in high school. Uh, this, as I was telling this girl, we're talking about God, and she's like, "Well, I don't believe in God." I'm like, "Well, I mean, there is a Bible." She's like, "Yeah, the Bible is just another book that somebody just made it up." So I was like, doubting myself. I'm like, "Wait a minute! I never thought of that. What if it's just a made-up <laughs> book and right? we're all believing like crazy? You know?" <laughs> So it, it, it did put put me into a spot like, okay, what now? You know, <laughs> you stink. <laughs> you need to go. <laughs> Just the yeah, poo poos. Now that you say that, I I thought of something that I had a problem with for a while. Yeah, go ahead. Was that um? So I got baptized with the Holy Spirit like when I was like when I was like thirteen or something. Yeah. And um, when I was about, I don't know, probably like 15, 16, we had this revival at our church, and this couple that came was speaking in tongues, 
And um, afterwards, my dad was telling me that that was that was of the devil, of them speaking in tongues. They were demon possessed. And so it really made me doubt for a long time. Am I really speaking in tongues, or is it the devil that's having me speak in tongues? You know, and I really struggled with that for um, a few years until um, until I got some clarity on it hmm. from another pastor. But um, it, it shed some doubt in me. Hmm. Hmm. Sorry. Yeah, it was really weird. Kind of made me lose my train of thought. I'm sorry. Never heard that. No, no, I, I just never heard that story. Um, hmm. Well, that takes us to the first of some of these questions that we're going to ask. And uh, this was actually one that was brought up um, by a friend of mine from college. So, should we pay tithes? Why? So. Okay, what does it say? It's, it says give to the Lord. Well, well I can't exactly. Okay, can't that's fine. That okay. No. You look like you're about to say something. I think yes, because ultimately God has given us the job, the money, um, to provide the money and everything, and we should give back what he has given us, at least some of some of it. Hmm. Okay. To pay, like, you know, the pastor and help support the church building and everything. Okay. Well, let me kind of throw a little bit of a wrench into it. He's not having a good time, huh? Let me throw a little bit of a wrench into it. And, uh, you, I'm sure he can walk around, bud. He can walk around. He's going to be constipated. <laughs> um, do what? Right? Should it? If anybody wants this, I'll be in there, okay? Yeah. Well, he doesn't want to be virtual, I'm sure. <laughs> there, it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. <laughs> right? Don't lie to me. <laughs> um, so... Did you know that the New Testament doesn't say anything about paying tithes? Mm. And the Old Testament doesn't say anything about finances being given in tithes, but only the new, the grain and that kind of stuff. Huh. What do you guys have to say about that now? Well, in the old, doesn't in the Old Testament say it, it, it's not necessary about the money, but it's about the time that you... Offer yourself. Uh, what, what do you mean? You know, like whenever they were, they were, um, uh, what they were doing. Uh, when they were, when they were serving in the temple, I would say. Okay. And, uh, um, when when the people of Israel they were they were brought out of Egypt when they were doing the sacrifices or they had to carry stuff, you know, I think it was Moses that said to the people that um, it's like, give, not give to the Lord, but like help in any way you, you can because, uh, how do I put it? Um, like, like offer from your time to serve the Lord, it's not necessary to give something to the Lord as long as you're offering time uh -huh. to serve the Lord. You know what I mean? I'm pretty sure it was something like that. I'm just not sure of where you're talking about. Um, I Are you talking about when they're building the tabernacle? And uh, Moses says, hey, if you have anything to give for the, for the building of the tabernacle, that part? In Exodus, I think it is. That plus the time to help with, not just giving. Okay. You know, like let's say I have a dish, I'll just give a dish. Uh -huh. But actually to go and work for. It. Okay. You know what I mean? Uh huh. So I mean that that should be included in that. It doesn't have to be money. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Maybe I spoke too much. 
<laughs> You're not taping that, are you? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. I, I thought you knew. It's always recorded. It's okay. Uh, my son's been throwing a fit the whole thing. It was all recorded, so whoever's listening to this online, they can really. Wow, that kid won't shut up. <laughs> I I also think it's a good idea to pay price to keep and a way to keep us humble, I guess. Okay. And to us, I guess, depend more on God than our own. In our own because okay say you get your paycheck and it's less than you thought and you have just enough for your um, rent and utilities and everything well even if even if you just have enough for the rent and utilities I think you should still give your tithes and if if if, if God doesn't supply the money that you need to pay you know your rent and the utilities you know maybe borrow some money from a friend or something and then pay on back your next paycheck. Hmm. Just because we should be re relying more on God than, than our money, you know? Or go without something that month. Okay. Um, let's kind of go back to the to the question that I asked um, that was actually motivated by my friend there um, about, you know, the Old Testament doesn't say doesn't say money it says you know to give from the grain and whatnot and it um uh, what was the other point that i said the new um, testament doesn't say oh and the new testament doesn't say about giving um tithes so let's let's kind of lean it towards that way what do you guys have to say about that D didn't they deal more with like goods back in the day instead of money yeah so wouldn't that be more more um The whole building the bridge thing, you know? We need to see what it was then and there. And oh, then right. We get to where Sorry, she said building a bridge, and I was like, they built what? <laughs> when was this? We need to see how it applied to them, and then bring it over to how it applies to us. Okay. They dealt with grain and cattle and everything back in the day, more with, than with money, because they traded goods all the time. Okay. So now, we deal with money more than trading goods. Okay. So we should see, like, what they did. And give our money instead of. I think that's a good. I think that's a good thought. Does anybody else have something to offer on this? You guys are being awful quiet. Diane and Gracie are the only two sticking their foot in the <laughs> mouth. You guys are being. You three are being awful quiet. <laughs> See now, Diane's not gonna say anything because she knows it's recorded. She's like, no. No more! No! <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Um, what about the thing about it being uh, not being in the, in the in the New Testament? Yes. That doesn't mean anything. Okay. I'm supposed to go by the whole Bible, not just the New Testament. Okay. I mean, even Paul used the Old Testament as references throughout his letters. Okay. All right. So if, yes, if we are supposed to t pay tithes, excuse me. I already said this, then why is, okay, I already said that. Um, now, um, this is an interesting thing that he brought up. Remember, Paul said not to give out of compulsion, out of, you know, what you have to do. Okay. What you want to do. Um, yeah, but as you exactly as you feel impressed, whereas a tithe is at ten percent. I mean, you guys are really not giving me much tonight. <laughs> it was a long hot day, huh? It's okay, I understand. Um, and if we aren't supposed to pay tithes, then why does the law say we should? How does that translate over if we aren't supposed to be nice? Um, so just as a last thought before we go to the actual answer, we are free from the law, with, and the law was for Israel. Don't forget that. So we'll we'll look at the answer, but but don't forget when you're looking at the when you're looking at the law of the Old Testament, remember that it was a stipulation given to Israel. Israel, if you do this, I will do this. Okay, which means it doesn't directly apply to Christians today. Does that make sense? The law does not directly apply to Christians today. Does that make sense? 
Because we're not we're not Israelites, and Jesus has already come. Does that make sense? Before there was, remember, a couple weeks ago we talked about the promise plan. How it was all founded on the promise that God gave to Adam and Eve when they fell, and then again to Noah's son, and then again to Abraham, and then again, remember that? We talked about that, and we traced the promise of God, how it was given throughout Scripture, and it was given before the law was given. Do you guys remember that? Um, so, um, yeah, remember when, when you're looking at the law that it, it's not directly applicable because we're not under the law. Yeah. Yeah. So, that takes us to the question of what is our relation to Israel? Israel was in the Old Testament, we're in the New Testament, so how do we relate together? Serve the same God. Okay. Um, do we take their place? Do we... Because we talked about Jews aren't saved, right? They, they still have to be saved by Jesus, right? How do we relate to Israel? I feel like it's an easy answer, but I can't think of it. <laughs> A good answer. Good answer. I mean, just because we're not Jews, it doesn't mean we don't relate to them. We, we suppose it's required from us to do the same thing what they would require from is from people of Israel to do. Well, not entirely, because if you remember in like Deuteronomy, for instance, it says, um, "If you do this, I will give you the land." Well, God's not going to give us the land in the Middle East. Well, I'm not talking about now. I'm not ta talking about like everyday life. Okay. All right. But the law was pretty entwined with Israel's um, whole thing in the land. A lot of it, like, if you do this, I will bless the land. If you do this, I will not bless the land. Do you know what I mean? And so how do you pick and choose what parts directly apply and which parts don't directly apply? See what I mean? I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just trying to I'm trying to push this deeper since you guys aren't giving me anything. <laughs> hey, we get three people here. I'm not saying anything. Yeah, I know. Especially Ben back there. At least Chuck cleared his throat. <laughs> Nicole, you're the only one left. Give us an answer, buddy. I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Um, we are under the same promise as the Jews, but it has been enriched and brought to its conclusion through Jesus. Okay, Basically, this is how it is. There's God's people who before the law just had to – they just put their trust in God. Okay, But then the law was given, and God said, this is a temporary covenant. You have to do this at this time until the Christ would come. But then Jesus did come, and so we don't have to follow the law anymore. And so now we're under t uh, under a time of what's uh, of, uh, of what that Paul calls calls being under grace under the law of grace, um, which basically, as Jeremiah the prophet prophesied, the law is written on on our hearts. The Holy Spirit kind of convicts us when we're doing things wrong. You know what I mean? He changes us, and he it's it's not a to do list anymore. You know what I mean? You can go to church wearing rags, and it's not going to matter. Whereas back in the time of the law. You had to have a priest go into the holy place with certain clothes on, right? Now you can go, you can go to church, you can go wherever because you worship in spirit and truth, not in a place. Does that make sense? Um, however, we're under that same promise that God said, you know, how he would, how he would, um, when he, when Adam and Eve fell, and he said, you know, about how we would bruise the serpent's head, how that, that how this, how the, um, the offspring would bruise the serpent's head, which is Jesus. See what I mean? Uh, we're under that same promise. See what I mean? So, um, for now, just kind of see it as this. At that time, the way to becoming God's people was the same putting your trust in god but you had to fulfill the requirements of like the sacrifice for instance of the, of the old testament okay but now in this time it's been broadened where you have to do those things because jesus was the sacrifice and because he's also the priest 
I mean, that kind of cut out a lot of legwork for us. <laughs> um, so now the people of God are not so much if you're circumcised or not, but if you're washed by the blood. Since the circumcision was just a foreshadowing of what would later come. Um, so the principles of the Old Testament still apply, though the application has changed. In other words, you can't read the Old Testament and, and say this directly applies to me. See what I mean? You have to kind of like Grace was talking about, kind of wade through that. But, um, so then do tithes still relate to us? Now, this is a common misconception. It's this. We are under the law of grace now. So nothing applies in the Old, in Old Testament. Well, nothing directly applies. Okay, I'll give you that. But, just because we're not under the law doesn't mean we should purposely do things contrary to the law. Does that make sense? Like, for instance, the law says don't sleep with your father's wife. Well... I'm under the law of grace. Well, I probably shouldn't do that, though, still, right? Right? In fact, wasn't this addressed in 1 Corinthians, I believe? There was a sexual situation going on, and he said, hey, this is not cool, right? But they're under the law of grace, right? Well, yes, but you see what I'm getting at here? Um, when you're under the law of grace, if you continue to do the things wrong, that shows that you're not actually saved. Does that make sense? Because our actions will always speak from the abundance of the heart. Does that make sense? Yes. From inside of us comes forth, uh, I believe Nicole has a piece of paper, right? Can uh, Diana, can you break bread with Diana? Yes. Um, what was I saying? I'm sorry. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, uh, what was I saying? Uh, anybody? Uh, Under the law. Uh, <laughs> Corinthians. Where was I going with that? You still shouldn't do it even if you're not under the law anymore. Okay, well, moving on. Uh, <laughs> since I have no idea what I was saying. Um, yes, they do. It, it, the ties does still relate to us because something was doing... Uh, just because something was dear in the time before Christ doesn't mean it is automatically not heated. Sex with animals, serving other gods, stealing. These are all things that we still shouldn't do. See what I mean? Um, oh, yes, that's what I was saying. I remember. Okay. So when someone is genuinely saved, God changes their life. Gradually. Gradually. And you will oftentimes trip over the same sins for a long time. Okay. So with that being said... That the evidence of uh, one of the evidences of being saved, though, is a changed life. Gradually, you will change, and if you just continue to live in your sin and broadly or, uh, proudly proclaim it, you are in essence testifying that you aren't saved in the first place. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Because if you truly are saved, works will follow. Does that make sense? Not because you have a to-do list, but as you seek God and as you worship God. You just stop doing the things. You know what I mean? You stop doing the... Does that make sense? Like, friends, I'll give you an example. I thought that I was so righteous because I did all the things people expected of me. I always wore a suit on Sundays. I was I was there for every single service that the, the doors were open. I Go down the list. I thought I was, you know, I was really the cat's meow. Can you can you do something about that? Um, and, but then as I sought after the Lord, he set me free from the law. See, I was fulfilling the law of man thinking that it was making me perfect. Does that make sense? I was doing all the to-do lists. I was, I was, I'm at church every single, every single time the doors are open. I always dress nice when I'm at church. I did, see what I mean? It was all about my righteousness. See, I was living under a law of man. But as I sought after the Lord, he freed me of those things, and I stopped doing those things out of compulsion because I realized they didn't save me. See what I mean? I was trying to earn salvation without actually believing that I was trying to earn salvation. Does that make sense? I thought, okay, now that I'm saved, I have to follow through on these things, or else I'm going to somehow lose my salvation. See what I mean? It's, it's not like that. So whereas some people get delivered from things like alcohol, I was delivered from the law. See what I mean? Does that make sense? Kind of. Um, so, um, so the evidence of being saved is, is a changed lifestyle. Yeah. What was your question? Later. Okay. All right.
We are not saved by the works of the law, but we shouldn't live as lawless on purpose just because of, of grace. Paul talks about this pretty much all in 1 Corinthians. Start at chapter 1 and end in chapter, like, what, 15 or whatever? It, the whole thing is about that. I mean, really, the whole thing is about it. Um, and if, once again, if somebody claims that they are saved, but then they go out and live however they want continuously, day after day, year after year, that's evidence that they're not really saved. John talks about this. Yes, John, in First John. Pretty sure it's First John. Homework assignment. Prove me wrong. Go home and read First John and tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, so we are, we are not following a to-do list. Okay. And the Old Testament, remember, the Old Testament was given to the Jews at that time as a guard before the Christ had, would come. Okay, so when you're reading the Old Testament law, do not do this. Do, 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 okay, I need to do that. Okay, I need to do that. See what I mean? Draw a principle from it, yes, but it's not a to-do list. See, and that's why I, I talk so much about the thing with the tattoos. Because people nowadays still try to make it where you have to follow the Old Testament law. It's not like that. Doesn't matter. See, I mean, it's a it's the law of grace. That doesn't mean you can do whatever you want, but that does, and that means you don't follow the the law anymore. Does that make sense? So, anyways, um, so we'll t we'll look at uh, passages now that have to relate with this. The first one is in Matthew, um, chapter seventeen. Grace, is he hungry? Matthew 17. In verse 24 it says this, When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? He said, Yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said, From others, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open his mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. Now what Jesus is saying is he, being a son of God, being the son of God, doesn't have to pay because he's he's, he's exempt from that tax. See what I mean? But he sent but then he says, but just so that they don't get offended, go ahead and pay it. So how does this apply to us? Well, likewise, we wouldn't have to pay that tax either because we are sons, right? We don't have to pay the temple tax. Does that make sense? But um, keep in mind that the early church didn't have buildings. This is specifically about a Jewish practice that, that they used, okay? Does that make sense? So this, this practice is dated. Um, this doesn't really in, in, involve whether we should pay tithes today. This is just... Okay, because people always bring up this verse for some reason when we're talking about this. So then that brings us to 2 Corinthians, which is the most quoted verse when talking about tithes um, uh, from the New Testament, because it's really the only place that that people or that people think that they're talking about it. So 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And I'm reading through till 7, so right there. Um, what people don't understand when they use this for arguing about the tithes is that Paul is talking about an offering, not tithes. See, when he says not to give under compulsion, he's saying don't give an offering under compulsion. He didn't say don't pay tithes. This has nothing to do with the tithes. This is the situation. Corinth was a wealthy city. The people who they were collecting the funds for, not so much. And out of that, but there was, if I remember correctly, this was during the time of a major famine. And so they, they needed the help. And so he was trying to, trying to encourage the, the church of Corinth to help them with the funds. That's an offering. That's not a tithe. Yeah. Right? Right. See what I mean? So I don't I don't really understand why people bring this up when you're talking about tithes, because it's talking about offerings. Even the Old Testament law made a separation and a distinction between the offerings and the uh, tithe. Yeah. See what I mean? 
So why shouldn't we do the same thing in the New Testament time, separating the two? Because they are two different, two, definitely two different things. Um, and the and the and the and the purpose of this is different too. A tithe is to do two things: one, instill the fear of the Lord, and two, to provide for the for for God's servants. Right? Right? This did neither of those things. It helped people who were in need. Therefore, it's not a tithe. See what I mean? So, I could keep going, but I think you guys see. It's an offering, not a tithe. Um, you can't go to the Old Testament. This is how you shouldn't go to the New Testament in addressing something. The Old Testament teaching on this is completely already discredited. I'm just going to take the New Testament by itself. This is how you should do it instead. Read the Old Testament and then see what has changed during the time of the New Testament. Like, for instance, read in Leviticus chapters 1 through 5 where it talks about the sacrifices and then realize Christ was the perfect sacrifice, so I don't have to offer sacrifices anymore. See what I mean? You take, you read the Old Testament, and then you see what the New Testament has to say about it, if, it, if anything changed or not, and then you move it forward. But you shouldn't read something in the Old Testament and, and immediately say, not for us today. See what I mean? The Old Testament, for instance, talks a lot about, and we'll talk, we'll talk about this either ne tonight or next week, about horoscopes and different things like that, you know, fortune tellers and that kind of stuff. New Testament is mostly silent on it, mostly. Um, it had to say a few things, but mostly silent on it. Um, so does that mean we can go to fortune tellers and, 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 and you know, all these different things? Well, no. So, I mean, you, you don't immediately discredit something just because it's in the Old Testament. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um... So that takes us to 1 Timothy 5.18. Now this is actually one that has to do with uh, tithes. This is the first out of out of, um, out of them that I personally believe has to do with tithes. So I don't know why they bring up those other three. Um, 1 Timothy 5.18. Um, For the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain... And the laborer um, deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against... I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, right there. And I don't really want to go into that other part because it's kind of a, it's a whole different thing. But basically what he's talking about is the way that a pastor is worthy of getting his getting his pay. And he talks, I mean, you can read through First Timothy yourself, but that's what he's talking about there. So this would actually be a tithe. Does that make sense? Because remember, the two purposes of a tithe, to teach the fear of the Lord and to provide for God's servants. This is providing for God's servants, therefore it's a tithe. See what I mean? Yeah. So that's where your tithe should go, to the support of the ministry. Um, mm -hmm. So pastors are worthy of the pay. And so then that brings people to the question, okay, so, so we, should pay, we should pay the pastor. What about the building? Why do I have to give towards the general building in my tithe? Why does my tithe even go to that nonsense? Well... Remember, the early church didn't have a building. People would meet in different houses and whatnot. But then, as the church grew more sophisticated and whatnot, they realized that it was more convenient to have a building. Mm -hmm. So, if we enjoy using a building, like our building, where we can have a food pantry and we can have a fellowship hall and we can have a sanctuary, if you enjoy those kinds of things, that costs money. See, I mean, you have to pay the, the mortgage if there's a mortgage on it. You have to pay uh, the utilities, the this, the that. That's something that, that we all have to share on the burden of because we want that ministry to go forward, right? So, so we're all kind of – does that make sense? Yeah. We're, we're all encouraging that so that we can do those things because it's going to be very complicated to run a food pantry out of a house, yeah. especially under under Roadrunner because there's a lot of regulations. I don't even know if they'd let us do that. I don't think so, but I'm just throwing out a, a, a guess there. Um, but anyway. So then that takes us to Malachi, which is probably the most quoted verse from the people who support tithes. Okay. Uh, Malachi uh, chapter 3. Verses 8. You know, I will say this. Gracie said something that I, I, I actually agree with. She said about, you know, you should always make sure to honor God with, uh, God with your tithes even if you don't think you can afford it that much. I would like to add on to it, though. Oftentimes, when you can't afford tithes, it's because you're not honoring God with your money. Oftentimes. Not every time. Not every time. You guys heard me say that, right? Not every time. 
However, a lot of times people go, want to spend their money however they want, and then they want to pay their tithes, and everything will all be good. Well, that doesn't isn't exactly how it works, and we'll talk about that in a second. Matthew 3, 8 through 11 says, Will man rob God, yet you are robbing me? But you say, How have we robbed you? And your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with the curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Now, let's kind of wade through this. There's a few things to notice with this passage. First off, this is conditional for Israel. You as a New Testament New, new uh, uh, a Christian will not be blessed upon blessings for giving tithes. This is conditional for Israel. How do we know that? Because the book of the law said, Israel, when you get to the promised land, you honor me with your tithes, and I will bless you. He doesn't. He didn't say everybody for all time will be blessed. So that's the first thing. Okay. So if it's if this is if this is a conditional promise for Israel, then why does he warn us like that? Basically, what he's saying is this: you're not following the law, and then you're wondering why the conditional promises aren't being met. Do you, have you guys ever read the book of Deuteronomy? It says, "If you do this, I will do this. If you do this, I will do this." Malachi is uh, is is what happens when they didn't do that. See what I mean? And so the prophet is telling them, hey, the, the, the book of the law already told you guys, if you don't do this, God's not going to bless you. See what I mean? So how does it relate to us as, as New Testament believers since we're not under the law, so we don't have that conditional thing going on? As you obey God and as you put your trust in him, he will give you what you need. Not what you want, what you need. Jesus talks about this when he talks about how much Jesus care, I mean, uh, God cares for the sparrow. Remember that? And, he, and he, so that would be what the New Testament has to say about that. We have to obey God in what He calls us to do, and God and God will God will lead us in that. He expects expects us to obey when when He calls us to something. So will God bless us when we pay tithes? Sometimes He will, but that's not a promise for every New Testament person. Okay, I've seen a lot of people, poor people, who pay their tithes every week. Okay, I've seen that happen. So we're all clear on that, right? Right. Once again, a lot of times people read the Old Testament law and they don't see how it applies to them to us today, so they just kind of go crazy with it. And they just kind of go wild. Um, I I do think that God wants us to pay tithes, and I do think that God will God will provide for our needs. I think the Bible is real clear on that. But you know, so anyways, um, so God does cause what we do do to be less profitable when you when we disobey. When God tells us something and we don't obey, He causes what we do to be less profitable. Um, Plus, our less get the better of us when we don't submit. That's just a principle of life anyways, regardless of whether the tithes or not. See what I mean? Um, our less will get the better, better of us. If we don't seek after the Lord, um, things just – it's like we're tempting ourselves. Does that make sense? And I don't have time to talk about um, temptation and all that stuff. But um, So I will say it like this because this verse has been so taken out of context. I just want to summarize this verse. God will not give you financial over overflowing in your bank account just because you pay tithes. First thing, okay. Second, not just because you pay tithes doesn't mean that you will have everything that you want. Okay. All right. As you honor God, things will go things will go better for you. But that does not mean that you're going to receive some supernatural blessing over you just because you pay tithes. And we'll get to that in, in Amos. Um, now Proverbs three nine, and, and concerning the issue of oh tithes is only with mon with uh, th with the their grain it's not with money. Well, let's look at pro what Proverbs has to say. Mm -hmm. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. With your wealth and with the produce. So that kind of discredits the whole claim about it only being about the produce, doesn't it? Yeah. God didn't. God didn't say only with your money. The law was only with, was with the grain because. How do you guys get paid? You work, and then what do they give you? Money. Money, right? Well, not so much with Israel. They worked, and then they gathered their grain, and then they used that 
to either get whatever, get whatever, whatever they needed. So how was money used during this time? Money at the, at the time that the Old Testament law was given was used in, in conjunction with things. You would use things and or silver and gold and that kind of stuff. See what I mean? You'd use them both. Money had not taken over as it does today. And now we have something called credit where there's just a mythical number in the air of, oh, well, I'll give you 2,000 imaginary dollars, and then you spend those imaginary dollars, and they charge you, de they charge you uh, uh, interest on that. See what I mean? So our, our money has drastically changed from what it was back then. Okay, they, you have to remember they didn't have this idea of mythical money. It was something you actually had in your hand. I have a piece of silver here. You know what I mean? So, um, <clears throat> Genesis uh, 14, 18 through 20. And, uh, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, uh, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Um, now, obviously, this foreshadows Christ, as the book of Hebrews talks about, obviously. But um, there's, there's a few things to notice. First off, the tithe was started before the law. The tithe was not conditional on the law. Both Abram and Isaac tithed to the Lord. But the law wasn't given until Moses. That means the tithe was started before the law. So just because the law has been fulfilled doesn't mean that the tithe has stopped. Does that make sense? Um, Jesus does not mean... Um, the, the, the fulfillment of Jesus doesn't mean we shouldn't honor God and provide for his servants. So Christ has come now. So now God's workers don't need to be provided for anymore, and I don't have to honor God with my stuff anymore. How do you figure? See what I mean? Should we give God less honor now that we're under grace than we did when we were under law? That doesn't really follow, does it? Um, so uh, Deuteronomy 8, 18. Basically, if you're tithing and have this mindset, God better bless me, you're probably not honoring God. See what I mean? You're doing it with the wrong purposes. But when you look at your money and you say, God, you've given me all of this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give, give back to you for your kingdom. See what I mean? When you do it out of the gratefulness of your heart, see what I mean? That's what Abram did when he gave to King, King Melchizedek. See, I mean, he, he said, you know, everything. And in, in fact, Isaac uses almost his exact same words. He says, "Everything that you bless me with, God, I'm going to give ten percent back to you." And then he goes up and marries his wife and all that stuff. Uh, Deuteronomy eight eighteen. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth, that He may confirm His covenant that He swore to your fathers, as, as it is the same. It is He who gave you the power to get the wealth. Um, 1422 basically the Bible teaches that some God makes some rich and God makes some poor some earn their wealth some are born into their wealth but whoever it is God provides for the needs um, according to what what that person needs see you know what I mean mm -hmm. and so some I mean have to be content with a little and some have to be content with a lot it's just how it goes. Deuteronomy uh, 14, 22 through 23 says, You shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year, and before the Lord your God, in the place that he will choose to make his name dwell there. You shall eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine, and of your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. And then in verse 29, um, and the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your town shall come and eat and be Filled, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands that you do. Okay. So to learn to fear God and provide for the needy and God's servants, we submit to authority. Okay. Yeah. The the tithe was, was done in conjunction with um, 
kind of like the recognition of, of God's authority over that, or that person's um, authority as given by God. Yeah. Melchiz when when Abraham tithes to King Melchizedek, he, it's, a, it's a way of recognizing, um, like blessing God, realizing that this is his servant. You know, does that make sense? I'm saying it retarded, but I hope that that makes sense. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. And if you notice in the tithes, whenever it mentions it, it always mentions the servant of God first. Deuteronomy is one of the few places that it also throws in the needy person as well, because he realizes, uh, not because he realizes, but because there's an over overstock. Does that make sense? You provide for the servant, but you should not provide for the needy. See, the law had it built in there to give compassion to the less fortunate. Does that make sense? So, anyways. So that takes us to Amos 4.4. 4. You know, I've known a lot of people who said this. I pay my tithes and offering, and, and I... And so I think God will bless me again and will bless me. Well, what about your living? See, because what people try to do is they try to do this. I'm going to live however I want, but then I'm going to pay my tithes throughout the years, and it's going to mean that God's going to just pour out all kinds of blessings on me because I don't have to live God's way. I just have to pay tithes. Do you not understand the Bible or just not read it or just ignore it? See what I mean? This is what Amos 4.4 4 says. Come to Bethel and, tra and transgress to Gilgal and multiply transgressions. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Um, offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving of that which is leavened and proclaim freewill offerings. Publish them. Um, for so you love to do, O people of Israel, declares the Lord. Um, and I, if you're reading through here, what he's talking about is just because you're obeying the tithes doesn't mean you're in the clear. Say so they were doing all kinds of stupid things, and then they were bringing their sacrifices to God, and were wondering why they weren't blessed. And so that's what Amos is talking about in chapter 4 here. Yeah, go ahead and go up to Bethel. With Bethel was a holy place. Go up to Bethel and, and, and multiply your sins, but then bring your bring your sacrifices and your tithes. Say, so, I mean, he's being sarcastic. That, that doesn't put you in the clear. Just because you pay tithes doesn't mean it, it doesn't matter that you're living however you want. Which is why I'm so surprised when people do this. I'm going to live however I want, and then I'm going to pay tithes, and God's just going to put me in the clear, and he's going to put a hedge of protection over me just because I'm paying tithes. Do you not read the Bible, or are you just not paying attention to the Bible? See what I mean? Um, so it doesn't put you in the clear. Now, money was not used in this. I already talked about this. It was used in association with goods, not in replacement. Okay, I already mentioned that. Um, so that brings us to – that kind of wraps up the whole question. With all those things, I want to hear what you guys think. So with all the things considered, do you think we should pay tithes or do you not? I think we should. Okay. Why? Um, do you, do you agree with what I was saying? or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I agree with everything Was there anybody who didn't agree with what I was saying? And it's fine if you don't. I just want to hear from you. I mean, I want to hear what you guys think. Should we pay tithes? What's your opinion? Okay. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's also important to note um, that tithes are separate from giving different things to the church and offerings and stuff. Because I know that these one people that bought all these Bibles for the church and they said, this was my tithes. Well, not necessarily. You need to give it to the church and the church will buy what they need for the church, not what you want them to need for the church. That was an offering that they were exactly. trying to make into a tithe. Exactly. It was an offering. <laughs> There was an interesting story that my great grandpa told. Um, he he needed some shoes. Um, he was in a place, and he you know he, my great grandpa started a lot of churches, which 
this isn't a way to get rich. If you're wanting to get rich, don't start churches. Um, and he came from Tennessee and started them all over the uh, the Indian, the Native American territory. He started our church here in Cholerosa. He started um, uh, the one up in Mescalero. He started um, all, all kinds of them. I don't even remember where all the churches are. But he started all these different churches. And there was one time when um, he he needed shoes. I mean, they were just worn out. There were holes in them. He, he, you know, and he was just praying, asking for the Lord to give him some. And there was this woman in town who had been saving up her tithes money because there wasn't a church. And uh, so she she saw him out there, and she said, well, God told me to give you this money. See what I mean? God was able to direct the tithes. Yeah. See what I mean? That makes sense? Yeah. But in a non-traditional way, but it went to God's servant who needed the money. And it was, if I remember correct, it, it, was, it was exactly what he needed for the new pairs of shoes. Um, maybe a little bit over it, but I think it was right at the at it. But I don't really remember. Can't ask him either because he's dead. Um, so I think there is something to it. Honestly, I think there is. When you honor God, and not just with tax with tithes, I'm talking about in your life. When you honor God with your life, like God just has a way of blessing you beyond beyond what you deserve. You know what I mean? Whereas when you continually harden your heart, things just don't go very well. I mean, goodness sakes, it seems like everything falls apart. I mean, eh. anyways, so. Uh, so what about taxes? Because some people bring up this question. Well, if the, if the government is immoral and they're, they're doing all these things that just aren't right, do I still have to pay taxes? I mean, they already have such a high tax rate. Um, what if I just fudge my taxes just a little bit? What do you guys think? I actually know a pastor that does not pay taxes because of that reason. Yeah? <laughs> and like the verse you read with the pulling the money out of the fish. Yes. It, we we owe to the government what we owe. If we don't want to pay the government taxes, then we need to move somewhere else that doesn't require taxes. You know? yeah, good luck with that. Right. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> we I, we need to abide by the law, and I think abiding by the law will show witness to a non Christians to show that even though. We don't technically have to be follow the law. We still are to show honor to the government and to the people that God has put in place. Uh, I like where you're going, but pause real quick. We don't have to follow the law of the Bible, Genesis right, through Deuteronomy. Right, right, right. We still have to follow the law of right, the land. Right, right. Just want to want to put up a quick uh, disclaimer <laughs> there. I never once said we don't have to follow the law of the land. Never said that. Huh? Right. Okay, proceed. <laughs> I don't want I don't want to get stoned or have a uh, have the IRS come after me? Goodness sakes! I didn't say that. <laughs> what do you guys think? Should we pay ta in Texas? You guys are so not, quiet. Not that we want to, but we have. To. Okay. Mm, okay. Because it's required from the government, and whatever whoever is in position, whoever made up this law. It don't matter, but it, it, if it's if it's in a it's in a law, I'm not saying about Israel law. I'm saying uh, right, right. This land law. <laughs> I think we should obey because whatever God put in position and whatever it's in place, we just need to honor it. So let me throw something at not you guys. I want to. How many how many of you guys like America? Yeah, it's, it's better than where I used to live. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, moving on. Uh, <laughs> Even though we don't have to pay taxes there, I like it. <laughs> well, one of the big reasons why America was actually founded was because of a little issue with the ties of the king of England. It was a little bit too steep, and the people didn't think it was very fair. And thus, America was born. So if it wasn't for people revolting against that, America wouldn't be a thing. How do you guys feel about rebellion in the case of high taxes and that kind of stuff? Should you still pay taxes in that kind of situation? Because the American founders didn't. What do you guys think? Well, I think there should be definitely a limit on how high the taxes can go. And what happens if they if they pass that? I mean... Then I think we should, but I think as long as they're within a decent range, we should. Uh, when you say it, if they go past a decent range, we should we should rebel. 
start another America, or you call it New America. <laughs> Just New kidding. New America. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, my gosh, yes. <laughs> okay. What are the rest of you guys think? I, I, I think America was coming across soon, and I mean, starting a new nation, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. So, um, do you guys think that think that rebellion in that case um, it was was a lot was okay? You don't think so? Why? I think that their attitudes for leaving was wrong, and their attitudes when they got them was wrong. Okay. All right. I'm liking this. I'm liking this. I think the only law we should should not follow versus uh, you know. Is the law to not not worship God? Okay. Otherwise, we should need to be following the laws of the land, even if it is taking up all of our money, because we we live here. We have to obey the law. Otherwise, we're we're in rebellion, and if we're okay. rebelling against the government, then it's going to show up in other areas and eventually go rebelling against God. Let me go back to Ben real quick. I like what you're saying, but I want to kind of build on what. what Build on Ben's answer there. Do you think could, under what circumstances do you think a rebellion would have been justified, or do you think that rebellion is never justified? Okay. Um, like, like when they were captured and stuff, you know, and yeah. you had them not follow uh-huh. exactly. You know, that was justified. But just because you're not happy with tax rates or something like that, you know. Okay. So you're saying pretty much just an act of God? Or <laughs> are there any other more I mean, I, I, I can't physical, think I guess? Of a good example of where it would be okay. That's um, fine. Okay. What do you guys have to say about this? I agree. It's windy. Okay. You agree with 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 what Ben said about um, uh, not rebelling or? Right. Not rebelling. Okay. All right. I I, I agree with Gracie with following the law unless it goes against God, except for the speed limit. <laughs> except for what? <laughs> God made an exception. You just have to. It's in Genesis. Well, if if you <laughs> if you talk to uh, the last gen two generations ago, um, they, they will tell you very um, vocally that if you disobey the the speed limit, you're not even a Christian. <laughs> I've had that lecture. <laughs> just kidding. I don't speed. <laughs> we're, Love you, we're, pop, pop. We're, we're given the you know power to vote for things that affect us in this country. So okay. I think that we should exercise those powers and not rebel against them. You know? Okay. So what if hypothetically we didn't have the right to uh, vote? Then we have to humble ourselves. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying, except for like an, an extreme example that you can't even think of, rebellion is just not a thing. Okay, Did, would anybody say, I mean, Nicole, you said um, rebellion could potentially be a thing if, if things are just too intense and too hard to live by. I mean, what do you have to say about this? I don't know, like, I think if it's done on the right terms and is it going against God, I don't really see a problem. Okay. This is just, I'm, I'm just loving this. Just great stuff for you guys to be thinking about, you know, to be thinking about. Um, I, I personally tend to side with with um, Ben just because of this. Ugh. I tend to I tend to side with Ben just because Christians should never get too focused on the government or political matters. You know what I mean? Um, our job is way more important than politics. We, we, we're tasked w with God's kingdom. I mean, that's way more important than, than, than taxes. So I think, you know, um, as far as as far as we can, we should try and focus more on God's kingdom. But since we have the opportunity to vote, we should take that privilege. You know what I mean? So, yeah. but anyways, that's just a little side discussion that I thought was fun. 
plowing ahead. <laughs> Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. Um, um, you shall not steal, which the government would then say, hey, this is our money. And I would say, hey, it's my money. And they would say, well, you owe it to us. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, Romans 13. And remember that Paul wrote this just a little bit before he was killed by Rome. He wrote this in the 50s, late 50s. He was killed in the mid-60s. So this is like 10 years later that he dies. Uh, Romans 13, um, 6 through 7 says... For because of this you also pay taxes for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing they are, they are tasked with the job of running the government and that's what they're there for um, um, I just kind of want to say I, I understand that there's a lot of divergent issues on this and uh, we've seen some of them here I mean you know from it's okay to rebel um, if things are, are bad to it's never or it's only in extreme situations uh, you know that kind of stuff. Um, some would, some are, are just waiting for for a thing. Oh, President Obama is now the president. We got to rebel. So, I mean, some some people are just looking for things. And you can bet when Hillary Clinton wins. <laughs> and I say that seriously. I, I'm with Ben on this. I really think she's going to win because even even with all the votes, I still think the states will still side with with Hillary. Honestly, I do. Um, so when she when she wins, um, a the apocalypse is not going to start when she gets elected and when she get, gets elected into office. A. And and B, that doesn't mean we should assassinate her or rebel or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I mean, like it, it, it's okay, we'll get through this. Emperor Nero may come again, but we will get through this. Um, uh, don't look for excuses to rebel, but never act contrary to God. See some people are just always looking for something to rebel. They're just waiting for it. If this happens, oh, I'm going to rebel. If this happens, I'm going to rebel. It's like, whoa, calm down. Calm the jets. So, I mean, that's what happens when you get so focused on... Ah, oh, it's the dog. That's what happens when you get so focused on um, the land rather than the eternal land. Okay. So, anyways, we'll stop there. Um, but next time, next week, we're going to talk about symbolism and stuff like that. Um, any questions about anything we talked about? No? Then I shall leave you with the question for next week. Do things have meaning or are they given meaning? Hmm, that's a good question. Like a peace sign. Is it does it ha it, it does it itself have a have a meaning or is it given a meaning by people? A what? A given a meaning. Peace sign. But a, or an upside down cross, or these kinds of different things. Do, does the thing itself have meaning? Or has it just been given meaning? And if so, how does that relate to how we should interact with it? Think about this. Just think about it. We'll, we'll talk about this more next week, but just think about that question. Does everybody understand the question itself? Okay, awesome. Uh, so, no questions?